that we have a wonderful guest speaker today. And before I read the official part, which is what I was looking for, I want to share with you that I first met, uh, she, at that time, she was a practitioner, Lori Sheets, at the Pacific Church of Religious Science in San Diego. And I met her in the year 2000 when I candidated there to be the new senior minister. And then, after I was fortunate enough to get that gig, Reverend, well, again, she was just a practitioner then, but the, the signs of ministry were already blooming. She was on the pulpit and introduced me on my first Sunday in San Diego. So it, it tickles me even more to be standing here introducing a ministerial colleague for you for our service today. But this is the part that you don't know. I See, I know all about her. Like She likes to sing and dance. And yesterday when we came to the center, I wanted to show her the center first. And uh, so we were talking about the song Happy. And we just I said, oh, really? Click, click. So we're having a great time. So that's the part that I know about her. And this is the part you probably need to know. Reverend Lori Sheets has been a part of our movement for over 15 years. She has served in many ministries from membership to congregant care. Her greatest memories of sharing our teaching came while living in the Ukraine for a few months and traveling to Cambodia. I also have to tell you that I also know she went to Katrina um, during that time when we were in San Diego and she served as part of our team that supported the healing and the restoration. As a staff minister at Seaside Center for Spiritual Living in San Diego, Reverend Lori has created, taught, and facilitated workshops and classes all while managing the youth and family program there. Reverend Lori loves to pray, loves to laugh, loves to support others in knowing their brilliance, and loves to have the opportunity to speak for you today, as is my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Reverend Lori Sheets. Thank you, my love. Thank you. What a joy it is to be here in Chico. Now, I came to Chico first time, and I came on Friday. And so far, I know where the university is. Good. I know where the farmer's market is. I know something else. But I also know where eight Starbucks are. <laughs> so I figure I am complete. I know Chico. I am licensed to go down there, down back down to San Diego and to share my experience here. Oh, there you go. I got one more thing to get on my list. Bid, that's what I saw. I don't know. I kind of know where the park is. I know where the Bidwell Mansion is. I didn't tour it, but that was the other one. That was that other one. So it is such a, a joy and such an honor to be here on this day with you. It's just a delight for me. Now I'm going to start off by sharing a story with you. It's about a first grader, and her name is Jillian. And at school, the teacher was teaching the children to plant seeds in little containers. Remember that? And we're going to talk about the plants growing. Well, Jillian, she kept going over to her plant and over to the container, and why isn't it growing? What is going on? I don't understand. And her teacher was explaining that there is growth. It is just happening underneath. And that underneath the soil, that there is a root system that's growing. And there is a foundation that has to happen before you see that plant. Well, Jillian thought... I don't see a plant, and there must be nothing happening. She would have nothing to do with the lesson. She just wanted to see her plant. Well, you know, Julie, uh, Jillian, is, is, she's not alone. There are 70% uh, of us are visual learners. Any, any person know if they're a visual learner? <laughs> I can't see, but... <laughs> I'm a visual learner, and what that just means is that that's the way we process information, that we want to be able to, to 
to see things. We're very aware of the way that things look. And we make decisions based on how things look and seeing things, which is why the car industry does so well. Before I was a metaphysician and I was very young and I went to buy a car and I bought the car, I saw a car, saw a car, bought the car, and I was just about to sign the papers and I thought, oh, does this car have an engine? <laughs> <laughs> this was many, many moons ago. I'm very wise now, very wise. But you know, when I want to see something come into my life, and this could be something that I have preyed on, this is something that I desired, something that I felt that I deserved, something that I had done the work, I had come into alignment with spirit, and I was willing and ready to receive this something, and that wasn't happening, you know, I'm a little, I, 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 I've, <laughs> who's the sound man in there? No, I, I, I've got a five-year-old Jillian inside of me. Where, where is it? Where is it? I get impatient. Just like the five-year-olds who don't know, who have not come into their spiritual maturity and realized that you really have to relax and sit back on your faith to trust in that loving presence of God, to know that the presence of God is working in and through absolutely every situation for my highest good, and that regardless of what I'm seeing, that the groundwork is being laid. When I first came to San Diego, from Colorado, I saw myself being a meeting planner. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to work for a company or an association or a nonprofit. And I wanted to plan their meetings. I wanted to create their, their conventions. And I wanted to travel a lot. And I thought at the time that that was a, a really good idea. For, for a woman my age and to travel. Okay, there were a couple challenges. One, I had absolutely no experience. <laughs> None. I couldn't even check into a hotel. I had no experience. That was one. And the other one, that just hands on ears, because I didn't know how to turn on a computer. <laughs> so here I am with this idea. I, it was very, very firm. It was, a, it, was, it was a vision. It was something that I wanted to create. I wanted to be a meeting planner. And I saw that very clearly. But the skill set was not there. The foundation was not there. But I kept that vision. And then I waited. And what Spirit did was, Spirit put the groundwork in, put me in situations where I could get the expertise and the knowledge, all of the skills that I needed. I, I was taught how to turn on a computer. It was hard, but I was taught. Yeah, I, was, I was a tough cookie, but, but I was. And, and that's what happens. But we, if, if we see something, if we know something, we hold on to that because it is, it's true. It is, it is pure. It is something that we desire. It is our, it is our wish but we may have to wait. We may have to have a groundwork because without that groundwork, we would not be successful here anyways. But you know, seeing things is very, is very 
a, a, it's a big part of, of this teaching. We vision here. Do we vision here? We vision here. In my center, we don't do much of anything without visioning. And it makes sense. As humans, we come up with all these ideas, but let's vision. Let's, let's bring into our awareness what God's idea is for this. Whether it's a new building, a relationship, a head of a ministry, whatever that is, let's, what a concept. Let's see what God's idea is for this. So we sit in the stillness and we actually, we find out. We're looking at seeing things. Have you done a vision board? Those are fun. I like those. We do vision boards because what happens is we write down our, our list of things to do, but it, with a vision board, you're cutting out actual pictures. You're cutting out uh, so that you, at one glance, if you have it on a board or a poster board, you can see where you're heading towards. You can see that. So when I say to someone, if I were to say, I see you. To me, this is only me. When I say, I see you, and I'm picking you out of the crowd. Of the crowd. I, but I see you. It's a very, it's a very personal, um, heartfelt connection. Like it's no matter what else, I see you. I don't see your hair. I don't see your clothes. I don't, not, I don't see your behavior. I don't see how, I don't think about how much money you might have, or I don't see anything else but you. And then I go deeper. And when I say I see you, I, I, I go deeper. I go into that place where the divine presence of God resides. That's what I see. That's what I see that you are one with the beloved. And I see your brilliance, and I see who you are and what is trying to be expressed through you. So this thing, I see you, is very different for me. It's very, um, I see the God in you. It's, it's very important. And so please say that with me. I see you. And please turn to someone and say, I see you. I see you. I don't see the stuff in your life. I don't see this. I don't see that. I see you. And that's what we as practitioners and ministers do. I see you regardless of what is going on. And that's why when things are going on that aren't so groovy, <laughs> that you, find, you beeline it to a practitioner because they will be able to say, I see you. Okay, we're off the seeing. Did I touch everything? Vision and seeing and uh, we're going to move on. And I have, I, I have a feeling I know the answer to this. But how many people here like to be heard by a show of hands? <laughs> oh, you got a congregation. <laughs> and I'm in there too. You know, we like, we like to be heard. Now, you know there's a difference between being heard and being listened to. And I learned this from my neighbor, Diane. She has a teenage son, Jared. And she shouts up, Jared, make your bed. 
And then about three minutes later, Jared, make your bed. And then Jared yells down, Mom, I heard you. Well, the truth of the matter is, it does, she doesn't know really what happened. Was she heard or was she listened to until she goes up into the bedroom and looks at the bed? So if the bed is made, well, what happened? He listened. He actually took action. He processed. Now, if the, if the bed isn't made, we still have a very honest teenager in our midst because he did say, Mom, I heard. You know, he didn't do anything about that. So as we look at that difference, we know that we want to be listened to. We want someone who is listening and might be nodding their head. I'd like to see a few nodding head. Usually when I'm speaking, they're either nodding their head, they understand, or nodding off. <laughs> I would like to see you A. I would like you to do A. <laughs> That's what I would like. But as we desire to have, be listened to and to feel as though we're connecting with someone, one of the things that Stephen Covey says is seek first to understand, then to be understood. That we're spending our energy to understand another human being, even though deep down we are wanting to be understood as well. And so to do that, to really understand another, it, it takes compassionate listening. It takes, it takes um, what I like when I'm wanting to be listened to. I want someone to ask questions for clarity. I want someone to uh, sit in the silence if I need to. I want someone who will read between the lines. So you're talking, but what's really being said here? Or what's not being said here? And oftentimes, isn't it that when we're in conversation, what is not being said is, is very, very important. And of course, the most powerful listening tool that we have is uh, the tool of meditation. Getting into the stillness with the divine. And if it is a case where you're wanting specific guidance on something, to ask for that guidance. Ask for that guidance and then to sit back and listen. Listen and allow that intuition to bubble up in a way that it uh, only spirit can make that bubbling of that intuition so that we know the path, we know the direction that we are to go. This is a passage that is near and dear to me and I I think you might have heard it, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to read it. It's only four lines, so it. There is just one life. That life is God's. I'm seeing some smiles. I knew I knew Duchess, so I'm gonna start over. There is just one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect, and that life is my life now. And so we know from that that we are living the life of God. What a gift. What an honor. What excitement. These hands are the hands of God. And they are out working and serving in a way that spirit would guide them. God cannot do everything that she wants to do <laughs> without having us, without having us. 
my heart is the heart of, of God, that it is open, it is nurturing, it is caring, it is ready to listen to anyone whom I might meet. So as we know that we're all these divine children of God, we know of our oneness with this divine spirit, there is nothing left to do but celebrate to celebrate who we are and to celebrate who the people are around. There is no room for judging. There is no room for criticizing. Each time that I judge myself and criticize myself, I am, or somebody else, I am criticizing me. Did that make sense in my, I'm criticizing me. So, Raise both hands if you're ready to celebrate. Clap them on top of your head if you can. Okay, let's go. In San Diego, I worked as a community relations coordinator in the hospital, in a hospital. And one of the projects that I was responsible for managing was called Catch Me Caring. And it was a program where employees would catch other employees doing something good. It could be uh, customer service. It could be a surgeon who extended himself to a family in such a way when they were needed that was above and beyond the call of duty. And then the observer employee would write down a, a, on that, on that a piece of paper, a card, and give it to me. And then I would give these care coins, these little care coins. And you could collect the care coins by do, continuing to do not. This was a couple years ago. Just, just be with me. You could continue to do nice things and collect these care coins and then turn them in for fabulous prizes. <laughs> I mean, shower radios, <laughs> T-shirts, things like that. Now, this was a while ago, and it was a little archaic, but you know what? It it did what it was supposed to do. It increased the awareness of good things happening in this hospital. The employees were no longer looking for what wasn't happening, what wasn't good happening. What was bad that was happening. Let's go with that one. Let's go with that. And so it was a very effective program. It was recognizing the employees, and it was acknowledging them, and it was having the employees catch other people caring as opposed to the boss. So here's the thing. I got it all figured out because I'm thinking that you could do this program here at Chico, right here in your center. No one agrees? But here's the thing. Is the treasurer of the board here? No? no? Okay, I can keep going. <laughs> Instead of care coins, Duchess dollars. <laughs> I think that I think that would be that would be much better. Have Duchess dollars. I have a quote from Ernest Holmes I'd like to share. I know that nothing but good can come from me, and nothing but good can return. It is my inward desire that everything I touch and every person that I think of shall be blessed and helped as I embrace our unity and our oneness. For it is this oneness that gives us the freedom to celebrate. 
we are all doing the best we can. We are all living the life of God in our own unique ways. We are all blessings. So what do we do when we catch someone caring? What do we do to celebrate ourselves and who we are and others? The first thing I always think of is that we, we just show appreciation. We appreciate people or things. I was able to go to Cambodia with David Alt uh, last year, and he has a foundation that uh, sponsors a school there. So we went there taking lots of school supplies for the kids. And talk about feeling appreciated. And it wasn't because of what they said, because of the language, but the smiles and the eyes that are just aglow and sparkling with enthusiasm and the joy I felt appreciated. Would I go back again to feel that appreciation? Absolutely. And another way we celebrate is that we just acknowledge people in our lives when they're doing, again, when they're doing something. I serve as a youth and family minister at my center at home, and if I see, um, especially Bob Driver, when I see him extending himself to a family or doing anything that um, is um, something that is worth catching and caring, I acknowledge him. Good job. That's great. I thank him. I appreciate. I'm grateful. It's, it's, and it's a constant thing. To me, that's a way of celebrating. And lastly, you know, we give recognition. That's how we celebrate who we are. We recognize people who have gone above and beyond, and we celebrate them. I know you're Volunteer of the year is Don Converse. And that is something that, you know, it's not taken lightly because I know he has done a lot of things in support of this center. And it, it is meaningful. And uh, when I don't acknowledge my folks that are helping me and youth and family, I notice that they they start to not, they don't want to serve as much. So celebrating first who I am, celebrating those who are around me is, uh, is very, very important. And so a quote I have from Oprah Winfrey, the more you praise and celebrate your life and the lives of others, the more there is in life to celebrate. That good. So these are ways that we can make our spiritual communities strong by caring for each other, by saying, I see you, I hear you, and I celebrate who you are. And so it is. Mm -hmm.